Well, good morning. Good to see you folks here. A lot of folks are gone, some of them traveling, some, on, some of them in Israel now, and that's good. You know, they're doing well, I guess. And I uh, hope you're doing well. All right, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll begin. Father, we thank you for this new day of life. I pray that we will be faithful to you in it that you will use us as you will for whatever purposes you have for each of us. Thank you that we can know that our steps are ordered by a sovereign God and that we can trust you with our lives in the midst of all of the difficulties that we see around us. And so, Father, I pray in these moments that we have now, the quiet time to get away and put our minds on your word and the things that are true from, uh, from the scriptures that, Father, you'll just uh, encourage us, help us, lift us up, enthuse us with what you have for us, I pray. So, Father, we just ask for your work of your spirit upon us to see the things that are here for our admonition, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In the last lesson, uh, we were studying the book of Ruth. And it's where it all starts for the study of Bethlehem. When you're studying Bethlehem in the scriptures, that's where it all begins. Actually, it begins a little earlier than that with the death of Rachel, Jacob's wife, and with the death of the Levite's concubine at the end of the book of Judges. And we talked about that last week. And uh, that's really a macabre story uh, that and the last three chapters of Judges. And uh, so that's the way the book of Judges ends with this terrible story of the Levite's concubine who died at the hands of the Benjamites. And uh, uh, when you come to the book of Ruth, it actually begins with now in the days of the Judges. So we actually go back into the judges prior to what happened with the, the, uh, the Levite's concubine. And you have the whole study of Ruth in the book of Judges. So not everything was bad during the time of the judges. Here's this little vignette, four chapters, that gives us a wonderful story. And uh, the entire background of the book of Ruth is in Bethlehem. And that's why we started there. Uh, lesson one, we called it the House of Bread. Beit Lechem, House of Bread, is what it means. And the principal character in the book of Ruth is Boaz, and he's a wealthy landowner, and uh, he provided food to sustain life. So uh, Christ also is the bread of life, and he sustains our life. The, the one who is the bread of life was born in the House of Bread. Kind of an interesting comparison. And then in the second half of the book of Ruth, the last two chapters, Boaz is also the kinsman redeemer. And that's the only type of the kinsman redeemer in the Bible. And so it's a very significant story about Boaz, the kinsman redeemer. And Christ is our kinsman redeemer. He paid the price and made us his own. And so the parallels between the book of Ruth and what Christ has provided for us uh, are really quite astounding. But that was the book of Ruth. And uh, that's the first significance of the town of Bethlehem. Now we come to part two, City of David. This is several generations later. The generations are given at the end of the book of Ruth. And uh, I think it's probably a great, great grandson that David was born. And so this is the time of David now. And the place where King David grew up, this story adds a whole new significance to the town of Bethlehem. Uh, David was very tired and thirsty. He's running from Saul. He's hiding with his men in caves. They're just trying to survive. And uh, at the time, a garrison of Philistines has taken over Bethlehem. Now, of course, I think they want to do that. 
uh, at the time here, it's after Goliath and all of that. And so they were embarrassed by that, that their hero was killed by this kid. And uh, so they went and they, and they went into the city of Bethlehem and a whole garrison of Philistines were in, Phil uh, in uh, Bethlehem. And uh, remembering his days as a shepherd boy in Bethlehem, David in the cave of Adullam, he just uh, kind of breathes out a simple wish. He says, oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. David grew up in Bethlehem. He knew where all the wells were. He knew where the best one was, and that was by the, by the gate. And three of his men heard his wish and decided to fulfill it, unbeknownst to David. So they broke through the forces of the Philistines. They filled a container with water from the well of Bethlehem and brought it to David. And he was amazed at what they had done. And uh, needless to say, it was overwhelmed with the, the bravery of his men. They had risked their lives to fulfill his wish to drink the pure water of Bethlehem. And uh, consequence, consequently, he would not drink the water. And uh, in a ceremonious fashion, he poured it out on the ground. And he said, be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Shall I drink the blood of the men who went in jeopardy of their lives? And uh, David was that kind of a man thinking of what it means. And uh, this was water too good to drink. Water from the well in Bethlehem by the gate that David had known as a boy and only God deserved to drink the water on that day. So David poured it out on the ground. That's an interesting little vignette that comes to us later on in 2 Samuel 23 and 1 Chronicles verse, uh, chapter 11. But uh, it kind of pictures for us David's familiarity with Bethlehem. Bethlehem is known as the city of David. Well, city has to be explained. You know, it's a town. It's just a little place where the clans lived, and it was too little to be counted in Judah. It wasn't very big at all. And uh, David had been born there. He grew up tending his father's sheep there. Uh, he had climbed the hills, and he'd wandered the, uh, the town, and he knew where the three wells were. Uh, but the one he liked the best was the one by the gate. That has, it was cool as well as being nice and wet uh, to quench his thirst. And uh, Bethlehem was known as the town of Bethlehem. I don't know when things get incorporated to villages and towns and whatever, but this is just a little wide spot in the road at that point in history. Uh, when Jesus, uh, the son of David, was born in Bethlehem, there were two groups of visitors. Uh, this is because there are two things that Bethlehem was known for. It was known for the place of his she the shepherds, uh, perhaps the inspiration for David later on for Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Uh, and uh, it's known for the place where David was anointed by Samuel as he poured the anointing oil over his head at the house of Jesse, which was in Bethlehem. So it's known for shepherds and it's known for the anointing of the king. Now all the other kings after that were anointed in Jerusalem. And the one before that was Saul, and he was not a legitimate king according to the plan of God. He was not of the tribe of Judah, he was of the tribe of Benjamin. And uh, so that one doesn't count really. But David was anointed in Bethlehem. That was unique for him. No one else was anointed in Bethlehem. Only David was. And when Jesus, the son of David, was born in Bethlehem, there were two groups of visitors. The first were shepherds. They're the first ones that came. David was a shepherd. And so the shepherds came. And the second was the kings. About a year and a half later, kings came from the east and they came to the house in Bethlehem, and they went in and worshiped him. It's known for shepherds and kings. The two visitors that we are told about in Luke 2 and Matthew 2, 
And so this is a significant scenario with regard to David and Bethlehem. He was both a shepherd and a king, and those are the visitors that came when Jesus was there. So that's what Bethlehem was known for. Every Christmas we celebrate the shepherds and the kings in the remembrance of the birth of Christ. But it's because of David who was a shepherd and a king. Now look at your outline, letter A. <clears throat> Bethlehem is the place of the humble shepherd. Uh, it's interesting to me that the first announcement of the birth of Christ was to shepherds in the field of, uh, of Bethlehem. Uh, it was not to the nobility, it was not to royalty, it was not to aristocracy. It was to humble shepherds in the fields of Bethlehem. The most incredible event in the history of the world was first announced to shepherds. That's quite an amazing thing, how God humbles himself to that. Um, the shepherds said, do not be afraid, or the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall, fall, uh, shall be for all people, for today in the city of David there has been born to you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So Bethlehem was the place of the birth of the Savior in the city of David. Now that word is used, the word city, in the translations of things, but it really is just a small town. This was their city, that is the shepherds, where King David had been born. Shepherds were important in that city. They were no doubt proud of the fact that the greatest king Israel ever had had been a shepherd like them in the very same city the very same fields. And now a savior had been born in their city too, a wonder to behold. <clears throat> this is really quite an interesting comparison as you think about the significance of Bethlehem. An observation, the shepherd of Bethlehem is an amazing person, thinking of David. David was a shepherd boy in Bethlehem and he was truly an amazing guy. Uh, and Jesus, our Savior, who would be a shepherd of his people, he's also an amazing person born in Bethlehem. So here's all the connections the Bible makes with this town. Uh, number one, he is sensitive and compassionate. That is David. He's a very sensitive boy, very compassionate. In 1 Samuel 16, if you have Bibles and want to turn there. In 1 Samuel 16, we have a, a, a series of verses that talk about how, how he was uh, very sensitive. I mean, he, uh, oh, this is when uh, Saul was having problems and he needed someone to play on a harp and uh, a lyre and, and uh, give him calmness. And so it says in 1 Samuel 16, verse 14 to 23, but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold, now an evil spirit from the Lord troubles you. Let our Lord now command thy servants who are before thee to seek out a man who is a skillful player on a harp. And it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon you, that he shall play with the hand and you shall be well. And Saul said to his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, and a mighty valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent manners, and an agreeable person, and the Lord is with him. Wherefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse, and said, Send me David thy son, who is with the sheep. And Jesse took an ass laden with bread and, and a skin of wine and a kid and sent them to David, his son, uh, by David, his son, unto Saul. And David came to Saul and stood before him and he loved him greatly and he became his armor bearer. This is the first reactions of Saul to David. And Saul said to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me. 
for he hath found favor in my sight. So I don't want David going home. I want him to be here. And it came to pass when the spirit from the Lord was upon Saul, when the, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, and David took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. David's a very sensitive guy. Saul was seeking a comforter. And uh, David is out tending sheep, hours singing and playing. That's all he had to do. Uh, it was the beginning of David's public ministry as a harp player. Um, he had time to practice sitting with the sheep. Time to contemplate and think. He became very good at it as he did with most everything he tried. And uh, it was a gift from God. He was the best harp player in the land. Very sensitive and compassionate. And he could help Saul. And it was a great ministry he had with Saul. Uh, we also see him uh, uh, very compassionate in another vignette in 1 Samuel 20. 1 Samuel 20 verses 41 and 42 and uh, Jonathan, who was the son of Saul, was speaking with a man, and the man left. And it says, as soon as the lad was gone, David arose out of a place toward the south and fell on his face to the ground and bowed himself three times, and they kissed one another. This is David and Jonathan. And uh, until David controlled himself, and Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, for as much as we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord be between me and you, and between your seed and my seed forever. And he rose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. So here's Jonathan, who's the very son of the man who is now trying to kill David, and he has a lot of compassion for Jonathan. And all the way through the account in 1 Samuel, Jonathan plays very big with regard to David. Uh, Jesus is the same kind of sensitive and compassionate person, just like David. In John 10, we have the story of Jesus as our good shepherd. In verse 11, it says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd uh, gives his life for the sheep, and that's Christ for us. He said, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known of mine. And the Father knows me, even so know I the Father, and lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have that are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And they shall hear my voice, and they shall be one fold and one shepherd. There doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man takes it from me, I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment I have I received of my Father. John 10 is a beautiful passage, highlighting for us that Christ is our shepherd, and he's a very sensitive shepherd. He's sensitive to the sheep. He knows their name, and they know his voice. And uh, so this is Christ for us. Uh, there's a a wonderful set of verses that are very unique in the Gospels with regard to Jesus' evaluation of himself. In fact, it's the only place in the Gospel where Jesus tells what he's like. He evaluates himself. He says in Matthew 11, verse 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly. That's the only thing Jesus ever said about his person. Meek and lowly. And you shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Those three verses there are the only time Jesus opens up himself. And it's interesting what he says, I am meek and lowly. I don't know if you've discovered the book by Dane Ortland. Uh, it's uh, called Gentle and Lowly. And he has a whole book on this verse and other verses that spring from it on the character of Christ. He's gentle and he's lowly. He's not image conscious, not trying to become somebody. 
uh, and it's an insight into Jesus' character. And uh, all through, that's one of the most encouraging books I think I've read in a long time by Dane Ortland, and the publisher is, uh, um, oh, I've forgotten the uh, name of the publisher there. But anyway, uh, he uh, is an editor uh, with that publisher. And uh, so anyway, I recommend the book to you, Gentle and Lowly by Dane Ortland. Uh, in Matthew 9 and verse 36, he's also compassionate, not just sensitive, but compassionate. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they were faint and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd, Matthew 9, 36. The analogy of shepherd and sheep is used over and over with regard to Jesus as well as with regard to David. And that's why the announcement was made first to shepherds, because Jesus is a shepherd and David was a shepherd. You know, the whole purpose of the Spirit of God is to make us like Jesus. He wants us to be sensitive and compassionate, to be very sensitive to other people, to be very compassionate toward people. Now, we struggle with that at times, you know, we have our ways and our wants and we, you know, we uh, get a little irritated at times with people when they don't do what we're hoping they will or whatever. A and uh, these qualities can only be produced by the Spirit of God within us to become like Jesus. All the way through the New Testament epistles, we're told to be like Jesus. Well, if we're like Jesus, we will be sensitive and compassionate. We will be meek and lowly. So that's what the Spirit of God is trying to do in us, to make us meek and lowly. Meek is the word for humble and lowly. So he is sensitive and compassionate. The second thing is, he is strong and, con and courageous. Uh, to me, meek doesn't mean to be weak. Meek or humble is having a proper concept of yourself. To be humble or meek is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less and not putting yourself first and putting others first and not even thinking about yourself as you're trying to serve other people. So uh, David was also very strong. Now in 1 Samuel 17, if you're still in 1 Samuel, let me read a couple of verses about David as he's talking to Saul about why he thinks he can kill the giant. Uh, 17 verse 32, 1 Samuel 17, 32. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of, your, because of him, that is the giant. The servant will go and fight with the Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Your servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he rose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. My goodness. And the servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing as he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, Moreover, the Lord who delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Now, that's really incredible. He's just a young kid. He's not very big, kind of small in stature. And he takes on a lion. He takes on a bear. He's hand wrestling with a bear. I mean, it's amazing what he does. And he took him by the beard and, you know, and then he smote the bear and he smote the lion. And this is a kid in the fields. He is a courageous and strong young man. Uh, the courage of his heart was incredible. Uh, 1 Samuel 17, verses 41 and 42, 41 to, uh, 40 to 51, talks about the uh, whole Goliath situation. So that's what he had said to uh, Saul. I can 
kill a lion, I can kill a bear, I can kill this guy. And so now in 1 Samuel 17, and he took his staff in his hand, that is David, out from the presence of Saul, and he chose five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in his wallet. And his sling was in his hand and he drew near the Philistines. Now, as he became very good on the harp, because he had so much time to practice, he became very good with a sling. You know, he could hit a dime on the wall, you know, kind of thing, and he never missed. He had practice with a sling, so here he has this sling uh, in his wallet, uh, was in his hand. And he drew near the Philistine, and the Philistine came on and drew near to David, and the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, and he was, for he was but a youth and ruddy and a fair complexion. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that you come unto me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the fowl of the air and the beasts of the field. And then said David to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of the hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day will the Lord deliver me into your hand and will smite you and take your head from you. And I will give the carcasses of the host of the, Philist of the, host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. And that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into, your, into our hands. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hastened and ran toward the enemy to meet the Philistine. This kid's not, a, you know, he's not shy. He's running right at Goliath. And uh, David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, slung it, smote the Philistine in his forehead. It was a perfect name. And... Uh, that stone sank into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and took and stood before the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and slew him and cut off his head. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Well, this is partly why the Philistines sent a garrison over to Bethlehem, not, no more kids coming out of Bethlehem, we don't want them any more like this. But at any rate, this is David and Goliath. You know, it's always been of interest to me that J David chose five smooth stones. I don't think it was because he was unsure of his aim or his accuracy. But why would he choose? Now, smooth, you know, because it goes through the air better, goes uh, in the air accurately. But five, why did he choose five? Well, here you have to go to 2 Samuel, chapter 21. This is, uh, we were in 1 Samuel. You have to go to 2 Samuel 21, verses 15 to 22. And uh, it talks about others of his mighty men who killed giants, the sons of Goliath. Uh, you know, of, of uh, yeah, the sons of Goliath. It says in uh, verse 15 of uh, 2 Samuel 21, Moreover, the Philistine had yet war again with Israel, and David went down, and his servants went with him and fought against the Philistines, and David grew faint. And Ishbi Bonab, who was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of bronze in weight, he being girded with a new sword, thought of slaying David. But Abishai, the son of Zerubbah, came to his aid and smote the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swore unto him, saying, You shall go no more out with us to battle, that you quench not the light of Israel. And it came to pass after this that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob, when uh, Sibachai, the Hushanite, uh, Hushathite, slew Saph, who was one of the sons of the giant. And there was again a battle in the Philistines where Elana, the son of Jeraor uh, of Bethlehem, slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the staff whose spear was like a weaver's beam. 
and there was yet a battle in, in Gath. There was a man of great stature who had every, on every hand six fingers and on every foot six toes and, and uh, 24 in number and also he was born to the giant. And when he defied Israel, Jonathan the son of Shimei, the brother of David, slew him. Now verse 22, these four were born to the giant of Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. Okay, why did he choose five stones? Because there were four brothers. He was ready for them all. He was gonna take on the whole clan of Nephilims, the giants. David was a courageous man, thinking ahead, very clever about what he does, can sling a sling so accurately, he can put it right in the forehead of this giant. And there were four brothers, four sons of the giant of Gath, and uh, he was ready for them too. That's why he chose five stones. I've always thought that's very cool. All through David's career, he was fearless and courageous as a warrior, but he developed his strength and uh, his courage and strength as a shepherd in the fields of Bethlehem. Now, Jesus, David's greater son, is strong and courageous in the face of death too. Uh, he's not in hand-to-hand -hand combat with a, with a bear, and he's not fearless of a face of a giant. But in the final week of his life, we walk with Jesus to the cross along the Via Dolorosa and, face, and he's facing the intimidating Goliath of Rome and uh, taking on Satan and sin and the demons of hell, felling them with one smooth stone, the stone of willful sacrifice. This took Rome totally by surprise. It took Satan totally by surprise that Jesus could win over him by doing nothing. I mean, it's amazing how when you study the philosophies of Jesus and how he wins battles, it's not by strength of arm, not by weapons and so forth. It's by knowing the Lord of hosts and having a, a sensitivity to uh, who he really is. So uh, he's courageous, just like David, his father. In Hebrews 13 and verse 20, it says, the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep. That's Christ for us. The Bethlehemite who laid down his life for the sheep. Beautiful pictures as we compare the links of David and Jesus. Now, no wonder the shepherds of Bethlehem came to worship him. He was one of them, a great shepherd, sensitive and compassionate, strong and courageous. They revered David and they worshiped Jesus. Today, we need to have the same qualities to stand against the evils of our day. Letter B, Bethlehem is the place of the anointed king. The other analogy that comes out of Bethlehem is the analogy of the kings. And in the Christmas story, who came from Bethlehem to worship him in Bethlehem. Jerusalem became the capital of Israel under David's leadership, and after him, every other king of Judah was anointed in Jerusalem. But first and greatest king of Judah, David, was anointed in Bethlehem. First Samuel 16, again, back there, verse 1 and verses 11 to 13. Verse 1 says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you unto Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And so he sent and brought him in. And now that is, uh, that is Jesse when he was challenged if he had another son and he brought David in from the fields and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and of a beautiful countenance and handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. And Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day onward. So Samuel rose up and went back to Ramah. So here's Samuel in Bethlehem, and he anoints David as king. Uh, it's an amazing story of how uh, he anointed uh, Samuel to go to Bethlehem after the events of Goliath, after Saul's failures. And uh, 
David didn't really begin ruling there anymore. That was many years later that he ruled in Israel, but he was anointed as king there. Several observations. A man from Bethlehem is an unlikely king. In chapter 16, beginning in verse 2, all of the sons of Jesse are paraded before Samuel. And it always begins with the oldest. So Eliab comes in and he says, no, he's not the guy. And then the, the second came in, Abinadab, and no, he's not, he's not the one. And Shammah came in, the third one, and no, he's not the one. And Nathanael came in and he's not the one. And Radai came in and Ozeb came in after him. And no, they're not the, the one. Don't you have another kid? Don't you have another son? David was an unlikely prospect. His father didn't even think of him when they were looking for someone to be anointed as king. Seven sons of Jesse, six of them paraded before Samuel. And David is an unlikely prospect. Jesse never thought of bringing David. His father never considered him. He's a shepherd. He's a young kid. He's little. And uh, he doesn't qualify. That was his father's estimate. His out outward appearance was questionable, number one. In verse seven, and there's an interesting verse there we always need to keep in, in mind. And the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature because I have refused him for the Lord, he's talking about Saul, and have refused him for the Lord has uh, sees not as man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, the Lord always looks at the heart. And this is something we need to remember. It's not any prowess we may have, whether talents or strength or whatever in our own life. But if our heart is right, that's what God is looking for. And that's what God will use. So uh, we forget this in an image conscious world. You know, today so much is emphasis on packaging and, and imaging. Looking good is better than being good. Uh, marketing strategies, you know, hidden persuaders. We brought the, bought into the idea, even in the Christian community, that looking good is what we need to be doing. And that's really not the issue. And David, small, unimpressive, smelly, smelled like sheep, came in and Samuel said, this is him. This is the man. He didn't look like Saul. Saul, it says in 1 Samuel chapter 9, he was a choice young man, handsome, and there was not among the children of Israel a more handsome person than he. And from his shoulders and upward, he was taller than any of the people. He was tall and handsome, and whoa, this is Saul. And he turned out to be a wreck. So here's David. He goes in before Saul. He's going to take on the giant. And... Uh, Saul says, well, let me put my armor on you. And so in 1 Samuel 17, verses 38 to 40, and Saul armed David with his armor, and he put on his helmet of, his bronze, helmet of bronze and upon his head. Also he armed him with a great coat, coat of uh, mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he attempted to go, and he had not tested it. And David said unto Saul, I can't go out with these. And David put them off. You know, all this armor, all this stuff we're going to do to protect ourselves. He says, I don't need that. And David went out. He said, set me free and I'll go out in the power of the Lord. There is something about the power of the Lord, if we learn to trust him, that is so much better than any armor we can wear. Um, number two, he's despised and rejected by the leaders. King Saul turned on David. He had a whole different perspective later. And in 1 Samuel 18, verses 7 to 12, he's playing there and, uh, and the women are saying, well, David's killed, slain his thousands and, and David is ten, or Saul has killed his thousands and David is ten thousands. Saul was very angry and saying displeased him. And uh, what more can they do and take my kingdom? It came to pass the next day, the evil spirit from the Lord came on Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house. And David played with his hand at other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I will smite David, even to the wall with it. And David escaped from the presence of Saul twice. And Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him and was departed from Saul. 
and two other times he took his spear and threw it at David. Uh, that was what Saul's answer. I'm going to get rid of this kid. He's going to kill him. He's despised and rejected by the leaders. And from that point on, he had a horrific life of being hunted by Saul all over the country. David's men were the rejects of society, a ragtag, makeshift army. They lived in caves, and it was just an amazing group that he put together. And uh, so he was, David was despised and rejected by society, but he was anointed by God to be king of Israel. You know, Jesus also, the warrior of Bethlehem, anointed by God of heaven, king of the universe, he also is despised and rejected of men. When you look at Jesus, the man from Nazareth, can any good thing come out of Nazareth, Nathaniel said? He's dressed as a peasant. He's not dressed as a fancy man. He's not dressed like Herod. You know, he's just dressed as a peasant. He, in the triumphal entry, he's riding down Mount of Olives on a donkey. And uh, he's not on a war horse. He's on a donkey. They never accepted him because he didn't look like a king. He doesn't have any power to take on Rome, was their assumption. And that's just like David, you know, rejected, despised and rejected by the leaders. In John 11, at the raising of Lazarus, in verses 47 and following, uh, Caiaphas says a very interesting thing. And they're all standing around looking at Jesus, and he's just raised Lazarus from the dead. And they are astounded, but they're also very anxious about their own positions. Anyway, it says, and uh, then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council. What do we do? For this man does many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and the nation. So they were very afraid of losing their place, of uh, Rome coming in and whatever. And one of them named Caiaphas. This is the acting high priest being the high priest that same year, said unto them, you know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. This is when they calculated putting Jesus on the cross. It's expedient that he die and not all of us. And this spoke, uh, he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation and not for the nation only, but that he also should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then from that day forth, they took counsel together. This is the scribes, the Pharisees, the ruling elite. They took counsel together to put him to death. That happened at the raising of Lazarus, where they determined that they were going to kill Jesus. Uh, Isaiah 53 and verse 3, it says, He is despised and rejected of men. Uh, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. That was Jesus. In his day, he was despised, like David was. In the eyes of the Jewish leadership, the man from Bethlehem was an unlikely king. Let her see. The Bethlehem is the place of the conquering Lord. The warrior from Bethlehem is the undisputed king, like it or not, uh, despised or not. This is God's choice. David was God's choice, and Jesus is God's choice. He is the victorious conqueror of Jerusalem. There's a story in 2 Samuel 5 about their going up, and the Jebusites had the city south of uh, the main part of the hill of Jerusalem there. And uh, so he says, uh, well, um, they have a spring and they have a, a way they can get down that, uh, you know, a, a, a hole in the ceiling. It's where the, uh, the uh, stream runs under the rock, uh, you know, there. I said, if, if, one, if so one of our men can get up there and, and open the gates for us, we can 
you know, beat the Jebusites. And that's exactly what they did. And at that point, the place became known as the city of David. And uh, he um, ruled in Jerusalem because they defeated the Jebusites. Uh, so he conquered the Jebusites. Then Jerusalem was known as the city of David. Jesus one day will return. Zechariah 14 uh, tells us that he will return. Um, his feet shall stand that day on the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. The Mount of Olives shall be cleaven to in the midst of it. And Jesus lands on the Mount of Olives. And he goes down into Jerusalem and he takes Jerusalem again. One day he will return and he will conquer Jerusalem. Later in, or earlier in Zechariah 12, he says, and they will look on him whom they have pierced. And they shall... Uh, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. One day Christ will return, conquer Jerusalem. His throne is established forever. David was given a covenant by God early in his career. And that covenant said, I will establish his kingdom. And uh, I shall build a house for my name. He will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom. Speaking of David to David forever. I will be his father, he shall be my son. He, he, uh, if he commit iniquity, I will chasten him in the rod of men with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him. As he took it from Saul, I will put it away from you. And thine house and your kingdom shall be established forever. Before you, the throne shall be established forever. There's a trilogy of forevers. In 2 Samuel 7, it's going to be forever. For Jesus, uh, that was with uh, David. For Jesus, it's the same. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Government will be on his shoulder. He'll be called the wonderful God, the uh, wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. And then it says, Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end and upon his kingdom to order it and establish it with justice and with righteousness from henceforth even how long? Forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The covenant with David was forever and it will be fulfilled by David's greater son Jesus forever. So that's the study of Bethlehem the city of David. Shepherds and kings, that's why there are two groups of visitors in the Christmas story. David, the shepherd boy of Bethlehem, who was anointed to be king in Bethlehem. Jesus visited by the shepherds and kings in Bethlehem, for he himself was the great shepherd of the sheep, the anointed one of God, to be king over all the earth. You know, when Jesus comes as king, he will come to judge. Now, he is our shepherd the first advent and the second advent. First advent, he came as a shepherd. And that's what he is now. He's a shepherd to us who gives his life for the sheep. Now, he's the good shepherd bidding those who, will, uh, who are weary and heavy laden with sins to come unto him and discover that he is the savior. As the angel said to the shepherds, for unto us is born this day in the city of David a savior who is Christ the Lord. And so that's what we look for today. He's a saving one. He's the shepherd. And we can cast our hope on him. But now is the time. Don't wait until later when he comes as a judge. He's totally different then. In fact, he's totally different now in heaven. Revelation 1, it gives us a picture of Jesus and as the Son of Man. And he is awesome, absolutely awesome as the sun shining in its strength, it says his countenance was. And so that's how Jesus is going to come. We need to see Jesus as he is now. In John 5, verse 22, it, Jesus said, all judgment has been committed by the Father unto the Son. You realize that the great uh, judgment seat of Christ, Christ will be the judge. Do you realize that at the great uh, white throne judgment, Jesus will be the judge? He's the judge. He's going to come to judge. And we don't want to be waiting till them and not take his great offer now to come to Christ and be saved because now is the time when the shepherd says, I came to lay down my life for you. And I want you simply to respond to me. It's a great story about Bethlehem. Two men compared, that is, 
David and Christ and how it all happened in Bethlehem and how it's all reflected in the shepherds and the sheep, uh, the shepherds and the kings, and how they were both sensitive and courageous and, uh, uh, and David is absolutely a beautiful picture of Christ in all that he is. So that's our second lesson now, City of David. We had House of Bread with Ruth and now we have City of David. And uh, we're gonna continue to go. There are two more things to be studied to know Bethlehem really well. So we're gonna come back uh, next time, which will be two weeks from now and uh, we'll study Bethlehem again. Uh, let's pray as we conclude. Father, thank you for your word. And uh, I was rushing a little bit at the end to be done on time, but I pray, Lord, that all of this will sink in with us, that there's some things about Bethlehem that really are important for us to understand, that Christ is our provision, he is the bread of life, and that he is our kinsman redeemer but also that he's like David, so much like David, sensitive and uh, compassionate. He's courageous and strong. And Lord, he was such a beautiful picture of Christ who was born in his very town in Bethlehem. So help us to uh, see Bethlehem as we approach the Christmas season. And we're gonna come to Thanksgiving now and then the Christmas season and to realize that Bethlehem is really a tremendous story of God's provision for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Go deeper in your understanding of God, His people, and His plan for planet Earth. Zion's Fire Magazine is an exceptional resource with powerful insights from Scripture that provide a clear understanding of God's ultimate plan for the last days and the return of Jesus Christ. As a first-time subscriber, you'll receive a free one-year subscription to Zion's Fire Magazine with no strings attached. Request your free subscription by visiting our website or by calling our toll-free number and we'll send you six free issues, one every other month, for a full year. We depend on the generosity of viewers like you to support the ongoing production of these programs. Your donation, whether large or small, is greatly appreciated. Donations may be given online at www.zionshope.org or by calling us toll-free at 1-888-781-9466. Stay informed and see the latest from Zion's Hope by liking us on Facebook, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and following us on Twitter.